cheese and crackers. I just cracked one of these. Oh, oh my goodness. Big deal. Six Glenn, live it up. Glenn, live it up. This is 1967 bottled in 2013. Rare that you get to open something like this. That is truly what's up. Which cocktail are you going to make with that? I don't know. Sammy's been telling me I got to mix something with it, but uh, I don't know. I need to get better at mixing first. That'll just be in the background, aspirational. Maybe not just get yourself yet. some grapefruit juice, some herb saint. All right. Some basil. Spot, spot, spotlight. Oh, we're I'm ready. Yeah, baby. All right. He's ready for What's his up, close up, Mr. DeMille. He's ready for his close up. <laughs> Wow, uh, this is a big image of my kitchen. You guys can see my kitchen. Um, we've moved around a little bit. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, thank you guys for all joining us. Uh, really, really excited. Um, really excited to have you all here. Uh, really excited to do this class. Um, you can see I'm standing, which means I'm already out of my element a little bit. Uh, but uh, Sammy is not. Uh, Sammy is... The main reason I ever tried spinning up a cocktail myself, um, and actually the first thing he ever taught me how to make was a highball, a good highball, a proper highball. Um, and uh, and so when we were sort of flirting with the idea of doing this, uh, Sammy was like, "This this is exactly where we should start." And I was like, "Oh hell yeah!" Except this time, let's not cut my hand open. Um, the first time, <laughs> the first time, I, first time I did this. Sammy made me about six drinks before I tried my first one. Um, and uh, I only have one bad scar on my hand, and it's because I peeled off most of my middle finger. Uh, no, I, I just sliced myself minorly. So we're going to try not to do that. We're going to try to uh, we're going to try to educate you a little bit. Um, so I've already said too much, which is uh, which is usual. So I'm just going to introduce. I, I mean, you guys all know us by now, but I'll introduce us anyway. Um, Phil is in the middle here. Phil, spotlight yourself. This is Phil. He's our technical expert. Uh, he's the man. He's drinking expert. some Willet. If something <laughs> happens and it crashes, it's his fault. Um, and then, of course, uh, spotlight Sammy. Phil, spotlight Sammy. Uh, uh, hold oh, on, I was go. drinking. There we go. There we go. This is Sammy. He has way too much hair. Um, we are excited to be in his hands. And then me, I'm the mouth. I talk too much. Um, and, uh, and so I'm going to, I'm going to take it away, Sammy. I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, thank you, Nick. So, I mean, Nick, you, uh, the reason why like, I think it's best that you, that you opened was because you are, you are my, my, you are my star pupil. You are someone who knows whiskey as well as anyone. And, uh, knows the, the wide spectrum of flavor you can find in, in, in single malt alone. And yet, if you open your heart up to cocktails, it shows you this whole new world of flavor that you otherwise would have missed out on. And I think that some people can uh, have trepidation. Uh, they might think that it's a waste to, to, to mix anything with your whiskey other than water. But uh, if you walk away from this first episode of our cocktail challenge series, it's that there is so much to, to dive into with cocktails and they're not all necessarily like hard to do. First, I want to discuss why. why. Why bother mixing anything at all? And uh, for, you know, hardcore followers of, the, uh, of you know, TNT, you'll know, you might have seen me talk about this book before. This is the Crosby Gage's Cocktail Guide and Ladies' Companion. Uh, it's a great cocktail book from the 20s. And uh, if you want to know what the Ladies' Companion looks like, boom. <laughs> oh, oh my! That, that hits oh, damn. Some of That guy, that guy got things done in the twenties. Sizzling. <laughs> but here's, uh, here's what he has to say about cocktails and other drinks. A we'll quote from this gentleman: "In the world of potables, a cocktail represents adventure and experiment. All other forms of drinking are more or less static." The approach of the wine drinker to his glass, while pleasant, is completely formal. A real wine biber forbids flowers upon his table because the perfume of a rose obscures the less potent fragrance of the grape. Beer drinkers lead a dreary and gaseous life. 
ale, porter, and stout and bibers are also subject to similar gastric disturbances. Whiskey enthusiasts are cribbed, cabined, and confined to a three-lane highway. Straight, soda, or just plain water. But the cocktail contriver, you, woman, or man to whom this sermon is addressed, has the whole world of nature at command. The fruits of the sea and the plain, the forest, the orchard, and the garden are at your disposal. Fewer words. Uh, we're talking about cocktails, uh, specifically cocktails for those that may be new to them. This is the easiest cocktail we're starting off with, and it is a, uh, it is a classic one. And as such, like all other classics, it is doomed to be absolutely manhandled and ruined and, and reduced to, to, to shrapnel and ash because it's a simple drink. It's a whiskey soda. In fact, most of you will know this is a whiskey soda, and most of you will, 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 will scoff and pish and ha at the whiskey soda, as the English did with the naming of the drink itself. This is an old book called The American Language, another of my favorite old books. And it talks about, <laughs> this book was, I think, was printed in, in 19, 1937. Quote, the English, in naming their own somewhat meager cocktail inventions, commonly display a far more limited imagination. Seeking a name example for a mixture of whiskey and soda water, the best they could achieve was a whiskey and soda. The Americans, however, introduced to the same drink, at once gave it a far more original name of the highball. The, uh, the term highball uh, it refers to the glass that it's in, but the etymology of the word highball itself actually comes from railroad workers in a time when these actually, these guys were responsible for a ton of really interesting uh, jargon dating back to the late 19th century. Here, here's a few examples. Um, quote, here we go. They use crummy to designate a caboose, but they also use buggy, hack, hearse, cage, clown wagon, crib, doghouse, louse cage, monkey house, parlor, way car, shanty, or hut. The last is sometimes also applied to the cab of a locomotive. A Pullman sleeper is a snoozer. A large locomotive is a battleship. A stock car is a cow cage. A passenger car is a cushion. A crossover is a diamond. A train order is a flimsy. A freight yard is a garden. A switch is a gate. A yard engine is a goat. A signal torpedo is a gun. And a go-ahead hand or lantern signal is called a highball. The stick that they would pull to change the tracks was actually called a highball, and that's where the drink gets its name. That's why it's not called a whiskey soda. It's called a highball, which is why they should not be looking like this. This is the bullshit you order at a, at a, at a Ruby Tuesdays at 2 p.m. in Midtown. You know, uh, the city that never sleeps doesn't seem to wake up until 4 p.m. if you want a proper cocktail, unfortunately, uh, speaking for someone who lives in, in, in uh, New York. This is the version of a highball that everyone meets with derision, with absolute pain and suffering. This was a drink made with a shitty whiskey, with soda water out of a gun, in a warm glass with crappy ice that melted immediately. It was left on the bar for 10 minutes before the server remembered to bring it to you. And there's no garnish what to speak of. It's just, it's a nightmare. And who knows if you actually get soda water. You might get Sprite, you might get, you know, 7-Up, who the hell knows? This is not what we're making today. We're talking about highball at its ideal, at, at its very best form. And the ingredient that no one really talks about is cold. Cold is an ingredient. The colder a spirit is, the, uh, the more viscous it becomes. So we're talking about texture. Uh, when we talk about not having whiskey on ice, the reason why I tell people not to enjoy a whiskey on the rocks if they're looking to, to learn from it, is because uh, ice anesthetizes your palate, right? It numbs your tongue, so you can't get all the flavor. But we're not talking about being contemplative about our whiskey. We're talking about enjoying it. This is not a thinking drink. This is a drinking drink. And it's perfect for this time of year. So what I'm going to need is a glass that I've stowed in my freezer. I'm going to be using whiskey that I've stored in my freezer some nice fresh ice, um, and my ice, by the way, I don't know about your ice at home, the ice I have is in the same freezer as chicken tikka masala leftovers, 
ground goat. I got pieces of animals in there, man, that I, I don't even know where they're from. It's, it's, it, it smells delicious, but I don't want my ice to smell like my leftovers from last week, right? So because your ice freezes slowly and the outside is the last part that freezes, that's also where all the impurities are. So I'll, I'll, you don't have to do it today, but I challenge you all to smell your ice. Take an ice cube out of your freezer, smell it, and you'll think this smells like ice. What the hell is Sam talking about? Rinse it under your sink, under cold water for two seconds. And smell it again, and you'll realize what your ice actually smelled like beforehand. So it's, it's important to use good, clean, fresh, awesome, big old ice. I'm gonna grab my, uh, my, my glass with my ice. I'm gonna grab my cold whiskey. I have uh, my fruit for garnishing here, as, long, as well as my tools. I have a little, uh, little potato peeler. You can use a knife and a, and a cutting board if you prefer. I have a spoon, a, lo a lovely fancy stirring spoon. If you do not have a spoon such as this, you may use a chopstick or a straw or your, your finger if you prefer. I won't tell anybody. And you need a jigger, a measuring device that can allow us to make the same drink twice. Uh, this is the, the secret to a good drink is making it consistent. Those are the tools we need. I'm going to go grab my, my stuff is right here. I'm going to go grab that. I'm going to see you right here. And Nick's going to do the same thing. He's going to be my co-pilot today, making the same drink side by side. <laughs> Phil, give us the, Phil, give us the gallery view. Oh, boy. I don't know why anyone needs to see my face. I'm not mixing anything. I'm just drinking. <laughs> All right. So uh, here is my lovely, cold, tall glass. We're all going to have different glasses, so that's why it's important to measure. If you have a shorty or if you have like a, like a pint glass, and I tell you to fill up a glass with the soda water, we're going to have different tasting drinks. So my ratio I'll be talking about today is three to one. Three soda to one whiskey. And the whiskey I'll be using today is none other than Bob Blair 2005. Look at that lovely cold glass. The reason why I'm using single malt and not like a blended scotch you might more, more commonly find in a well is because a single malt scotch really gives you more texture, more, more uh, full body. That's, um, if you're going to be diluting this with soda water, you want to make sure that's strong enough to hold up to it. Um, I, I prefer, I prefer um, highballs with whiskeys that are aged in ex-bourbon. I find that sherry gets lost. They do other wines. Um, I think that you should use a whiskey that's at least 45% alcohol. Again, you want something that's strong enough to go in here. Uh, there are a few whiskeys in the market today. I'm not going to name any names, but they say that they are the best whiskey, the perfect whiskey for making a highball, designed for making a highball. Uh, not that impressive. I, 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 you, congratulations, you made a whiskey that can only be diluted. I, I, I'm, I'm not excited about that. I want to use a whiskey that I love drinking neat, that I can also enjoy when I stretch it out with some soda water because it's so complex and it's, it's so detailed. Okay, that's what uh, I'm looking for. By the way, uh, Tammy's asking a question. Have we filled our glass with ice already? Good question. I mean, I just, I just did, but... You can start with that. Normally, uh, I would say you add ice last because you don't want to you don't want to dilute things too early. But because my ice is already cold, there's no water in here. But feel free to fill up your your uh, your glass with ice. We're not using a mixing glass or a shaking tin to build this drink. We're building it in the glass. And I'm going to start by measuring out two ounces of whiskey. Um, Nico, what are you uh, what are you pouring, brother? I don't know. That's why I have to ask you. Um, I put two in the freezer. All right, I put two in the freezer. I put a uh, cast strength Tormor from Gordon and McPhail. Uh, it's a 12 year ex bourbon. It's 59.8%. My other option is a Spayburn companion cask. It's 46%. It's aged in, um, it's aged in Buffalo Trace barrels. Oh, wow. Both strong options. Strong. Very strong. 
I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give away that I'm gonna I'm gonna make one from both. But if somebody were in my position, which one would you recommend? Tormor, man. I'd go with Tormor personally. I, I I've had the I've had the Spayburn uh, band casting. That's dope. Uh, it truly is. I, I think um, I want something with a little more. Um, I want something with a beginning, middle, and end. And the Spayburn companion cask is dope. It's easy. It's 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 uh, it's caramel. It's toffee. It's 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 round. It's supple. But I want something that's gonna um, give me a little more of a fist fight. Um, yeah, go with go with the Tormor. Make both. And do do I change ratios because I'm up at sixty percent? Do I still pour two ounces or do I pour, pour an ounce and a half? So that's, that's a great question. So guys, if you guys have something that's around the mid forties, even anything short of 50, I'm measuring up my soda water as well. Uh, and I'm measuring exactly six ounces, of, which means again, two ounces of whiskey and six ounces of soda. If you have something that's cask strength approaching 60%, I might recommend, you know, adding an extra ounce of soda water. Um, to play around. Okay. The reason why I'm I'm even recommending this highball ratio. This is recommend. This is not even. If you're in Japan right now, the ratio would be more like five or six to one, not three to one. But Americans, such as we are, and such as our audiences, and I know a lot of us are spirits lovers, and maybe some of us are newer to cocktails than others. I think it's important to start with a a, a more spirit forward version of this drink, which already is super cold, refreshing, and delicious looking as it is. Um, start with three to one. If you have cask strength, add a little more soda. And if you want something that's even lighter and, ref and more refreshing, add more soda water. There's nothing, I mean, you could just, just taste it first and figure out what you like. You, let's be um, you know, scientific about it. One thing I you want guys, is that this- You guys see how hazy this is? Huh? Can oh, you see how hazy this is? Non-show yeah, filter. That's foggy. <laughs> Oh boy, what look at those fatty put deposits. The, put real non chill filter. When he talks about texture in single malt, that's what he's talking about. Mm. Sorry, no. sorry to cut you off. Go ahead, Tammy. No, no, that's, 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 that's perfect. I was just going to say that this, you might think that, like, uh, when, I was, when I was a kid helping my mom bake, and she was putting, like, she had me help put in ingredients in, like, making chocolate chip cookies. She wasn't looking at always add more of the things that I thought I would like. She wasn't looking around. I would add an extra little bit of, of brown sugar, and I, I would put way more than a teaspoon of vanilla extract, and I'd put way more of this and that. I'd put more salt in it. You know, um, I think we have we have a, this built-in uh, desire to use more of the flavor thing in a cocktail, but the highball is actually paradoxically a cocktail that gets worse the more whiskey you put in. It's actually better if it is more diluted uh, to a certain point. You know, I wouldn't go one to ten sing, uh, whiskey to, to soda. But in, try it. Try it just as you've made it before you garnish it. Before you do anything else, take a sip. If it's as hot over there as it is in my kitchen, I got the AC off right now. Um, it should immediately revitalize you. I imagine it would. Uh, I I don't have AC on, and I don't have any ice in my glass, and I do not feel revitalized. <laughs> <laughs> just feel drunker and sweatier and. I wish I had uh, what you guys are having. <laughs> They're worse things. By the way. Uh, by the way, uh, Vlad is asking, uh, what Spayburn was that? Uh, didn't catch that, what, what it was. Uh, the companion cask. Yeah. If you're, uh, Bannon yeah, cask? Yeah, man. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. A little, um, little, more, little more texture, a little more nuance. Um, Nick, I've seen I, the, the bottle I have. I got from uh, I actually got from New Hampshire State Liquor Store across the border. I've only seen it in a few places. I I, I this was just sent to me um, a while back, and I and I it, it fits the profile ex bourbon ex bourbon aged plus forty six percent. So I was curious to give it a try, but I don't actually believe it's even available in Massachusetts. Mm. So explain um, why I haven't seen it. I put a, I, I actually, for those of you that like uh, staying cold, I really like metal straws. Super easy to clean. They're reusable. You're not going to kill as many turtles. Um, and they look, they look good open in glass too. Like, I'm, I'm a big fan of metal straws. But we got to talk about garnish. I know, Nick, you're terrified of this, but we got to talk about how best to pair some fragrance with your whiskey. 
So that starts with the with, with what your whiskey tastes like. So with Bob Blair, I think with Bob Blair, it's it's chalky, it's uh, it's it's almond, it's uh, it's it's marzipan, it's 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 uh, it's vanilla. It's got this really nice, lovely, lighter fruit. No, it's not. Um, it has texture, but it's not this heavy, decadent, sweet thing. It's got. Uh, it, if anything, it reminds me of like Chenin Blanc. It's like a wine wine. Uh, it's a wine drinker's whiskey. And because of this, I think uh, I want to use lemon oil, which will be more vibrant. It will bring more, um, more of a sort of. Uh, it will it'll enliven this cocktail. If I were to use Orange oil instead. Orange oil is is, uh, is definitely sweeter, and I would pair this with if I were using a sherry cask whiskey. If you have a sherry cask single malt that you're using for this cocktail, orange will will really bring those sherry notes up. And remember, if you if you're using a peated whiskey, even these uh, all the phenols and serinols, all the aldehydes, all the fun things that that create aroma that are in that whiskey are more likely to come up to the forefront, even though it's cold you have these bubbles coming up to the top. So it actually allows you to experience a, a whiskey you might know really well in a whole new way. So by all means, try it both ways. For the Tormor, Nick, what are you thinking, man? What, what would you, how would you uh, explain the flavor of Tormor whiskey by itself, Neat? Tormor, let's try it. The Tormor is grassy. It's vanilla. It's got a little citrus to it. Um, it has a little. I don't know what that is. Custard. Yeah, a little custardy, a little vanilla. I, I think mm. I, I actually think this one's going to go really well with lemon. Go with your gut, man. If you, if I'm going with my gut. I'm going lemon. It's, and then, the it's going in the gut, so go with the gut. If you go, if you guys cook, just think about how you would pair flavors otherwise. You know, lemon works well with like vegetal notes. Like uh, if you're making, uh, if you're making a pasta dish with um, like lemon pepper chicken, think about lemon how that works in there. Orange would not work there. If you're making a dish that has artichoke, artichoke goes well with lemon juice. If you were to make, uh, if you were to use orange, like candied orange peel works really well in sweets. Um, in pastries, orange blossom water is great with fresh fruits. You have um, like chocolate oranges are a very like common sort of treat. So think about like sweeter, rounder, fatter flavors with orange and leaner flavors um, and vegetal flavors working more with lemon. If you have a whiskey that is more sulfurous, think like a whiskey, a single malt that was, um, that was distilled using worm tubs where you have that sulfurous note, like struck match. That actually works really well with grapefruit peel. That's another cool way to, to kind of tweak this, this drink. And for folks that uh, haven't, or, uh, haven't made a peel before in their lives, I'm really just talking about taking peeler to your fruit as you would a potato. Um, and I'll show you my guy here. Hold this oh, boy. Thing. Don't, 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 uh, don't cut yourself too bad. I'm going to uh, make sure that I'm I'm putting a lot of pressure on behind behind where I'm I'm pulling from, from my thumb, and I'm going to just slice down, keeping yeah. the whole way, and keeping my thumbs and fingers away from it, and that leaves me with a tiny little swath. On one side is oh, and there's tons of oil, and the other side has this pith, this white pith. Keep the white pith side up. Make sure that the uh, the yellow side is facing over your drink, and then just give the peel a little bit of a squeeze like that, and you'll see the oil will come out. I'll show you a little bit more. It comes out like kind of like an aerosol. It just yeah, kind of spritzes I, out. When I was bartending, people would say like, "Did I even do anything?" And I'd say, yeah, yeah, come here. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Squeeze into their <laughs> eye. Immediately, they'd say, oh, my God, ah, I'm suing you. But they never come. They never come. <laughs> uh, this, this makes your drink completely change. Uh, if you were watching me closely, you also notice I, I poured an extra ounce of soda water in this drink because I want something that's lighter. Um, 
as long as you start from the same position, you can you can make the string be whatever you want it to be. And I have, I mean, I don't know if I've done it with uh, with Nick or Phil here, but I have taken frozen bottles of whiskey with me to the beach. I've made high balls on the beach before. Soda water, a lemon, a peel. It's delicious. You'll, I mean, I'm all about a Bud Light Lime on the beach, but this is so much better if you, if you put the, the extra time in. Mm. All right. All right. Oh, that actually brings us to a question from Sean, actually. Uh, when you put a bottle in and out of the freezer as needed, do you leave it in once it's in? Or do you, uh, can you take yeah. it out, put it back on the shelf? This, this bottle has been inside the freezer for its whole life, but I could easily have taken it out, put it on my whiskey shelf, and it would be unharmed. There's no irreparable damage to a whiskey being done um, for being frozen. Um, nothing that can't be fixed by just coming back down to temperature. What is worse is, is overheating your whiskey. If you heat your whiskey or expose it to a ton of sunlight, uh, that is something that, that cannot be fixed as easily. And by the way, for folks that still have some of their highball left, take a picture of it. Snap, snap, a, snap a selfie. Show us, take a picture of it. Make sure you have like a shot of the bottle that you're using. We're curious to see what you guys are using. Make it look, make it look sexy. And <laughs> do it to us. If you send it to us on Facebook or on our Instagram page, um, and you're willing to join us, we are for the next four weeks going to be planning on having different co-hosts. So uh, Nick, as much as we love him, this is the only time you're going to see him here. Maybe next week he'll be one of you guys. But oh, baby, the uh, you have to just be willing to join us. You'll be here. You'll be making the drink alongside of me. We'll be talking about it back and forth. But we need a picture of you guys uh, enjoying your highballs as they are currently constituted. If you've already drank the whole damn thing, I do not blame you. Just make another one. Yeah, just just throw it back. Make another one. <laughs> are we oh no, I have to make another drink. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, just make yeah, just make it make it look sexy. It's gonna be competition. We want we want some some sexy ass drinks up there. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's our brands or not, because we want to see what you guys are making. Because um, it's it's uh, it's super fun to to kind of make this team effort. It's we're gonna the next weeks are gonna be unreal. Uh, any other questions out there, Phil? The, anything I missed? Uh, I've just been bringing it up as they as they show up. Uh, there's one. Oh, this one from Vlad. Uh, your personal preference: soda waters? Do you prefer Q Fever Tree? Anything else? Hmm. I would say that I'm more discerning about brands when, when it comes to flavored sodas. Like they, I, I, I prefer certain brands of ginger beer and tonic water and even colas. But when it comes to soda water, as long as it's in a small bottle so I don't lose all the fizz, and as long as there's no um, additives, no preservatives, no sodium benzenate, no, uh, no calcium citrate, none of this stuff to, to mimic the um the, the constituents that you would normally find in mineral water that's what that's what club soda is when i sent out the email i made sure that everyone was going to bring seltzer or soda water that's just bubbles in water but club soda specifically is meant is meant to mimic um mineral water and that kind of throws a bunch of different flavors into the drink you can't control so i i uh you know Anything from, from you know, Q, Q and Fever Tree are fantastic. Like, don't get me wrong at all. But you can go, you can save a little bit of money. I actually make my own soda water. I have a, you see behind me, I have a little uh, whoop, soda stream machine. So I just make my own soda, keep it in the fridge, ready to go. It's always fresh. I can make it as fizzy or as light as I want it to be, and I can add my own sodas to it, uh, my own flavors to it, rather. But uh, yeah. All right, Timmy. Crazy. I have my test subject. Oh shit! Uh oh. All right. <laughs> Four more. <laughs> Companion cask. Okay. Oh, I think I like this one better. Companion cask, it is. Sammy, your lessons are paying off. <laughs> <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> got to hear it. I don't know. I like this one better. So Which maybe one? I'm the, – the Tormor is heavier. 
That's why she likes the. That's why she likes the companion cast. I, I'm. You 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 haven't converted me all the way where I don't like my spirit. My I like all my cocktails boozy still. Like <laughs> my daiquiri ratio. My daiquiri ratio is still. I still do uh, two three quarters half. My my Manhattans. I always use higher proof stuff. I, I just I, I lean towards boozy always. That's not a problem. Like that's just that's best preference. The fact that you're mixing them and finding what you like is is, is important. But the the thing is that if you were to really truly compare the Tormor to the Spaburn properly, you'd have to further dilute the Tormor such that they were the same proof. To under, to, and because Tormor is is fuller bodied. I'd be interested to see how the Tormor stacks up when you add another ounce of water to it and make it more. I did. I did seven, I did seven ounces water, two ounces Tormor. And what did you do for the spay? Six, two. Interesting. Yeah, so you're, you're, yeah that's, that's, that would probably balance out a little bit. Interesting. Now, so what about bitters, stuff, Sammy? Bitters. Hmm. That's another whole ball of wax. Ooh, bitters. These guys right here. Um, we're talking about the flavor components that we can add to any any cocktail. Bitters are basically the it's the salt cabinet, it's the sugar cabinet, the uh, the spice cabinet of of your cocktail table. If you want to add a flavor to cocktail, add a dash of bitters. A bitter is basically just an extract. Uh, it's it's alcohol, a bunch of herbs and spices, and has a bittering agent in it. Something that allows it to, to kind of read as concentrated and, um, and bitter to balance out you know, sweet flavors and, and such like that. Uh, so, well, Ango is the most famous, right? Yeah, if you see the yellow cap and the long label, this is what you can find not just in a, in a, in a cocktail supply store or a liquor store, but you can find this in a gas station. This is everywhere, right? Uh, it's very, very common, uh, not just in booze, but it's also great in, in, um, in food as well. Uh, we use this in fruit salad. Um, you can put it in soup. You can put it on pizza. You can do the hell you want with it. Just don't tell me about it. I don't care. You know, just, just you know, do what you want. Have fun. I put it on my eggs. Yeah, that's. <laughs> uh, oh boy, that's uh. You should, you should get that. I, honest to God, I don't think you can add. I, I don't think there's anything that you can't add Ango to. When in doubt, add a dash. Are you, are you part of? Are you a, a lobbyist for Angostura? I'm obsessed. Since since I've been introduced to Ango, I put it in everything. I put it in my daiquiris. I put it in my highballs. Like legit, anything and everything gets better with a dash of ango. Always. It says soups, cereals, salads, vegetable, gravies, fish, grapefruit, fresh, stewed or preserved fruits, jellies, sherbets, ice cream, many sauces, puddings, mince pies, applesauce, and all similar desserts. Now, do we know what's in it? Uh, fun thing. Also about the Angostura label, it has a label that is way too long. This is not by design. When the, when the folks at, uh, at Trinidad and Tobago first ordered the labels, they accidentally ordered the wrong size label for their bottle. But because of the sort of light, carefree attitude of Trinidad and Tobago, they just said, ah, we'll just use it anyways. And they, they just printed them and stuck them on here, even though it's like it's too big for package and because it was it stood out so much they've been doing it ever since they have not fixed the mistake so it's kind of indicative it's, it's evocative of like what you know the the culture of the area and, and how they just want to have a good time and, and also you know save some money like that would that would have been an expensive order to return now what i want to know is why they would list cereal under the things you could add bitters to i'm trying to imagine like how many dashes of Angostura you put into a bowl of Lucky Charms to one, really one dash. bring out I've tested one it. dash. It's one oh, dash. Okay. You need one dash, and and the bitters cut sweetness. So like I I like boozy, and I don't like overly sweet. But I I in all seriousness, I, I like when when I when I make a daiquiri or really any of those things, I really enjoy um, the fruit flavors. But I don't enjoy sweetness. I have no sweet tooth. Um, I never have had a sweet mm. tooth. I don't really enjoy overly sweet things. But I do like the flavors of sweetness. So you add the dash of ango, and it cuts that it cuts that sweetness down a little bit. But you still get all of the fruit characteristics. If when Cassie ever, I mean, it's a joke at this point. But if Cassie ever has me taste something and she thinks it's too sweet, she's like, I'll just say like, 
you know, this needs though. Like she got yeah. a container of uh, of guitard um, drinking chocolate powder, like to make uh, hot chocolate. And even though guitar uses dark chocolate, it ran a little too sweet for us. And I said, yo, add a dash of Bitterman's chocolate mole bitters to that. And immediately that drink was fire. It was so much better. A lot of drinks are just too sweet. Like I said, you can fix sweet with bitter or with acid or with spice. Pick one. So, Sammy... I, I what, what's the what's the uh, what's the deal with with ice? Uh, I think one of the one of the first things you always taught me was when you go to a bar, you can identify whether it's a good bar or not immediately by looking at the ice. Uh, that is true. Yeah, I mean, the the the, the stronger the, the the larger your ice, the slower it melts, right? And you might even order a drink that's served up like a martini. There's no ice in a martini um, in the glass, right? But if, uh, if the ice they were using was super, super small, then that means that when they were shaking the drink, it over-diluted. And that means that you're going to have a watered-down, stupid-ass drink that, that, uh, that got too watered down before it could get any colder. Uh, there are many different types of ice that are available to bars. Usually, it is an overlooked ingredient. The most common ice you find in, in big style restaurants to save money is derisively called or referred to hotel ice. It's hotel ice. It's this huge sheet and uh, it's, it, it just kind of fills up water over time and then it falls into this, this, uh, this cabinet. You capture all the ice, you throw it into your bin and you shake a drink and it makes the drink already a disaster. If you've ever ordered a, a Diet Coke with ice, this is usually what the ice looks like. Tiny little small. Mm. You can't shake a drink with this. You can serve like a, a Coke with it. Fine. Who cares? But what you really want is you want full, like big ass ice cubes. You want ice cubes that look like this. Usually they'll have a small depression on one side and that's called a, a cold draft ice cube. Um, and you, you'll notice it ex like right away. Cold draft ice cube, it, it, it's the same idea where you, you, you fill up a tray of water slowly and it chills and it actually comes out with clear ice. But the clearness doesn't matter. You, I want to make sure that you can shake a drink without it diluting too fast. Um, and if you go to a bar that you know, also serves big old ice cubes, that is even better, especially if, you, if you're a guy or a girl that likes to have you know, whiskey on the rocks. They'll have a big old ice cube or even an ice sphere mold. Like they'll have some of these guys. It's cute and it looks nice. Um, I wouldn't necessarily need it for a cocktail, but it shows you that they care about dilution. It, it shows you they care about chilling a drink properly. And that's what I look for. If I see, a, a, if, I, if I peer in, and I, I always do this, if I peer in over the bar and I look to see what's in their ice, in their ice well, and I see, and I see this shit. I order a, dr I order a whiskey, Ugh. or I order a beer, or I order a glass of wine. I do something else. If I don't see any jiggers, if not, if not measuring anything, I'm not getting a cocktail there. Um, I don't care how how much you've been practicing your four count to get me an exact ounce out of a bottle of Jameson. You're not going to be able to measure a quarter ounce for my, uh, you know, for my specific cocktail, like a. So so what are the what are the basic rules of uh, what what are the not the basic rules what are the unwritten rules of of conversing with a bartender ordering the right drinks like it, it, it it's like anything right where any hobby any industry any world has a has a language it has a secret handshake it has a um, it, it has an in crowd and everyone else. If, if you want to establish yourself with a bartender as being part of the in crowd, as being part of, if you want to give them the secret handshake, um, so to speak, what, how would you go about it? Not you. How would one of us go about it? You would go in and, at, and, and order exactly the right thing. And, and I don't know, uh, tickle the bartender's chin or whatever <laughs> you do. Um, but, but, but like, what, what does the average, the layman do um, to, to get, to, to get the inside scoop and to get the insider drink, because a lot of times there's the off menu stuff that, that most people can't get their hands on. 
No doubt, man. Yeah, um, it's a good, great question. I would say, you know, uh, for, if you're going to tickle anyone's chin, make sure you get consent first. Uh, uh, second, I would say the right drink is, is the drink that you, that you know you want in the moment. You know, so, like, I think the, the bravest thing to do is to order the drink that's not, like, necessarily cool, but the one that you know you want. And you will know what drink you want the more you, the more you drink cocktails. So you first, you got to get yourself into a good cocktail bar. And once you get into a good cocktail bar, and if you want recommendations, we'll, we'll be sure to email us. We'll let you know some of our favorite bars, either in Boston or New York or in the area. But I would say uh, rule number one is, is respect the menu. If you're in a good cocktail bar and they have a cocktail menu, they put a lot of time into developing that thing. You know, order one of those drinks, see what it looks like. Uh, if you are totally averse to sweetness, let him or her know, like, hey, I, this drink looks interesting. Is it, is it, is it very sweet? Um, I like stronger drinks. I like bolder. I like spirit-forward drinks. Uh, if you like sweet drinks and more flow drinks, tell them, tell them that. Let them know what spirits you like. I'm a rum drinker. I'm a whiskey drinker. This is, all, it, like, this is actually really helpful stuff to know. If I'm a bartender, these are things I'll ask. <laughs> tell me. Uh, if you want to be cool and you want to like, show off that like, you're maybe your industry or something, uh, a few of the drinks would be like a daiquiri. I know it's a silly thing to, to mention, but a daiquiri, the way that it's not a frozen drink that's bright red and, and covered in slush. It's, uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's white rum usually, fresh lime juice, and simple syrup. That's the original daiquiri, originally pronounced daiquiri for the beach. Uh, and Hemingway crushed these things. They were originally made with key limes. So even the, the acidity that we use in limes today is, is a little bit off. But the rule is you should always have more acidity than sweetness. So the, res the recipe that Nick mentioned, two ounces rum, three-quarter lime, half simple, is a pretty rock-solid recipe. Um, if, if you flipped the, the sugar and, and the lime juice, it would taste heavy and not at all refreshing. But the daiquiri is such a hard drink to balance that truly it's like, it's like, going to, it's like trying to become a, a, a line cook at a, at a fancy restaurant. They're not going to ask you to make them like French onion soup. They're not going to ask you to make a perfect meringue. They're going to ask you to make them an omelet. Because an omelet is, is a devilishly, secretly difficult thing to make. Can you make a French omelet without burning it? Can it without any brown at all? With a soft center that's perfectly set? Can you make one? It's about as hard as it is to make a daiquiri. It's a great way to judge a good bartender by ordering a daiquiri. And it's also just like a... It's a lowbrow, easy, relaxing drink that has a lot of acidity, and, and, and bartenders tend to like that stuff. It happens to also be the drink that we'll be making on week three of this cocktail challenge series. The last thing I would say is, you know, um, probably a, uh, a Sazerac, um, which is a dope, just a dope spirit for a drink, or a 50-50 martini. I think... What do, you, cool, what do you not order? What I not order? What do you not order? There are things not to order. I learned this. There are <laughs> things not to order on certain days of the week. Uh, so the, the last drink we're making in this cocktail series is called the Ramos and Fizz, uh, that, which uses egg white, um, which means you have to emulsify the egg white. You're not, just, you're not just diluting and chilling a drink. You're also whipping the egg to, to almost like soft peaks. And it, is, it takes a long time it, like, to make the drink according to... New Orleans. It, I'm not. I'm not an inherent of of of, of uh, you know the lamentations of the French when it comes to the cocktail making. It's 15 minutes to make that damn drink. You can make it in five or six, but it's a, it takes a long time to make the drink, and then you got to clean all your tins because there's egg white everywhere. If you order that drink on a Friday night in the middle of a busy day, you are you are. Oh man, you're gonna get the stink eye. You're not gonna be welcome there anymore. Man. Order that drink when it is slow. Order on a Monday or a Tuesday from someone that you know. Like, go to a good, go to a great bar, okay? Don't go to anything less than a top five cocktail bar and order Ramos Gin Fizz if you really want to know. And just don't, just don't order when it's busy because it can, it can put a halt to an entire night. You can get in the weeds because one asshole has a birthday and they want to have, uh, you know, whipped egg white drink. It's not, it's not a good look. Also, don't order Long Island iced teas. Make those at home, all right? Come on. What are we doing? Don't go out, I, I, go out to get drunk. Okay? Go out to like to learn something and have fun and and and, uh, and ask ask the bartender after you get to know him or her. Are you are you working on anything? 
Is there a drink off the menu? Is there something yeah, yeah. that you're, you're workshopping? Is there something that might end up on the next menu? Uh, you know what I like. I, I know what you can make. Just, just make me something for fun. That, that, that's why, how I've learned a lot of drinks I love today. What, what I do is I, I order either a Manhattan. Um, a, a, a Manhattan is always a Manhattan is always a good drink to, to, to see how they serve it, first of all. Um, see how they serve it. And if, if you order something, uh, you know, or I'll order a daiquiri, and I'll see how the daiquiri is. And if it's good, what I always do is if I'm sitting at a table, I will tell the server, please tell the bartender this, this drink was superb. Um, and, and then what I'll say is I, I'll say, you know, and would you do me a favor and ask the bartender to make me something they've been working on? And I'll usually tell them, a, uh, a, I'll usually tell them I'm a whiskey guy. I'll say, look, I, I love whiskey. I love Sazeracs. I love, I love whiskey sours. I love Manhattans. Um, you know, something, something that's a riff off of one of these, that's what I'm looking for. And, you know, if the bartender has anything, that'd be great. And a lot of times, actually, what's really fun is a lot of times the bartender will actually come over to the table because it's, you, you've given the handshake. You've basically said, like, you made a smart order and then you were appreciative. And a lot of times that's enough to get a bartender to come over and say, what do you like? This is what I'm working on. What do you think? And you'll get something. And that's when you start getting one to know bartenders, which is really fun. It's really, really fun to be a regular. It's really, really fun to be someone who people at the bar know who you are. And the easy way to do that is to order the right drink. Um, and then two, it, 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 you'll often, often get something that's catered to you. And that's just a delightful experience. Um, but I'm going to pause for a sec. We got a couple questions that came in. Oh, uh, yeah, there are a couple. Uh, one was about the ice, and the other one was about uh, the Angostura versus Peychaud's, which, honestly, if we rewind a bit, we were talking about bitters. That's one that I am a big, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very curious about myself because I've sold both, and I've always had to order both, and I was never really sure what was more important. I know Angostura is the is usually the default for most people, but Peychaud's was, like, the one that, seem to be like uh, yeah. another um, well-known uh, bitter, but, but, but slightly different. Yeah. Sammy, what's the difference? So uh, they're different, they're different bitters. They have different backgrounds. Uh, Angostura, obviously very storied history, similar to Peixot. Peixot came from New Orleans. It came around the same time that, uh, that the cocktail Renaissance was happening um, in the early 19s um, in, in, in the Southern United States. There's also a huge French uh, Creole element to this uh, particular part of cocktail history, such that we actually originally thought the word cocktail came from the, the French word for an egg cup, cocktier, which is not true at all. Um, but Peixo, like Angostura tastes like cinnamon, allspice, clove, mace. It's winter spice, and it works so well with brown spirits, specifically whiskeys, right? Uh, but Peixo is very specific. The flavor profile of Peixo is bitter orange peel, cherry, licorice, um, uh, anise. I would say, um, like, these are the, the main flavor profiles. It is a very specific flavor that you could not, you can't just inter interchangeably use Angostura with, uh, with Peixo. I would say that Angostura is like black pepper. It is so versatile. You can use it. Mm different dishes, not just like continental dishes, but Southeast Asian, Indian, um, like East, Eastern European, all kinds of different things. But Peixo, it's like turmeric. Like turmeric, it's got a very lovely, incredible, specific flavor that you have to use in the exact right dish. The, uh, the exact right dishes in this case, referring to, of course, the Sazerac we mentioned before. Um, the uh, La Louisienne is another uh, classic drink that calls for Peixo. Peixo, I actually, um, if you like a pink gin, uh, which is an old school drink, that's just, uh, it's basically a martini where you add a bunch of Angostura bitters in there instead of vermouth. Gin and Peixo are a great combination. I think Peixo with gin and soda or gin and tonic water are really lovely. But it, it's pretty dependent on whether you like licorice or not. Licorice and cherry and orange peel. If you don't like those flavors, mm. pizzelle, like classic Italian pastries that taste like licorice, probably not going to like pesho. If you don't like absinthe, if you don't like herb saints, 
if you don't like liquor, like if you don't like good and plenty candies, you're not gonna like Peixo, and you're probably not even gonna like it in the perfect cocktail meant for it, like the, like the Sazerac, because some people just hate licorice. It, it's like it's like tuna fish, peanut butter, chocolate, th- these big flavors that don't necessarily work with folks. So when in doubt, use Ango. Um, I would say the second best bitter to have is orange bitters. You can use these in anything really, truly. Any any cocktail goes really well with orange bitters. Peixo's, Peixo's tough. It's uh, it's it's specific, but you have to love the drinks you're making it with. All right. The, the next question we got was from Tammy, and it says, uh, so does your average home freezer ice maker make ice that is too small? I would add, does it make it ice that's too small, and does it make ice that's not dense enough? Uh, both, yeah, great follow-up, Nick. Uh, it is totally, absolutely dense enough because it's, it's solid. The, the bullshit that you see in hotel ice, you'll see the divots that I, I very quickly and hardly – put in there the ice is hollow inside it's uh, it's almost like imagine mm. imagine a flask it's just this outside perimeter with nothing inside it's, it allows it to freeze faster you're, you're basically this ice looks like a bunch of a thousand tiny little flasks your ice cube is a bludgeon it is just a, a thick full dense ice cube the ice you have at home is actually nine times out of ten better than or at bars so you're you're totally good um, if anything, sometimes what happens is that your ice is so big that it's hard to dilute a drink effectively. You can, you can certainly chill a drink, but you'll see that one, one of the reasons of having a spoon, like a stirring spoon when you're stirring, is to take an ice cube like this and crack it into smaller pieces because smaller pieces allows me to dilute my drink at the rate that I want to. It's actually, it's, it's kind of funny how we, uh, we need to purposely make our ice smaller in order to make a well-balanced cocktail by, uh, by smashing it up. But yeah, Tammy, your ice, I haven't seen your ice, but your ice looks great. I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Tammy, Tammy, I, I got another question. Why aren't we just storing like 90% of our spirits in the freezer outside of the, 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 the space constraints? Um, I don't know either, man. This time of year, it's it's uh, it just makes things easier. Like I um, when I was in college, it was common to have like a shitty bottle of, of vodka in, in a plastic bottle in the freezer. The reason why you put Rubinoff vodka or like Poland vodka in a freezer is because oh. you do not want to taste it. I'm sorry for everyone that feels like puke in their in their like coming up their throat for all the bad memories but like putting things in the freezer has a negative connotation often uh but by putting a whiskey in there i mean it 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 makes it easier and i'll go one step further like you can put a whiskey in there that you are always going to mix in a highball i always have at least one whiskey that is for highballs in there um i don't put gin in there even though i very commonly make martinis with with really cold gin i actually just make the martini and i pre-batch it and put it in the freezer Remember, a good, a good cocktail is 20% water. So why don't I just make 10 martinis, fill that out. So that means I need 30 ounces of gin, 10 ounces of dry vermouth, maybe three or four dashes of orange bitters, and then 15% water so that it doesn't freeze when it's in the freezer. Put it in the freezer, and then I can pour myself a martini whenever I want. Uh, I would say that the, the idea of having pre batch cocktails in the freezer is something that is is very much underappreciated and should be done more often. Don't overdo it. I mean, I think, you know, you don't need to have every single bottle you own in the freezer, but just know what cocktails you like. You know, if you like, if you like old fashions to be super ass cold, put a bourbon in there. If you like, uh, if you like uh, martinis, think about making one and putting it in the freezer. Hmm. So, no, I so got, Sammy, I... oh, sorry, go ahead, Phil. Go ahead, Phil. Well, I, I got a meandering question, uh, and it, it's it's the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding flavors, and uh, like really bringing it back to like what what we're doing with this drink here. The tiniest things will change uh, how this drink is ex- is expressed. Um, just deciding which kind of citrus we're going to be using, what kind of uh, whiskey to balance it with. But when you're going for something like this. 
this is the kind of drink that does well with with food just because it tends to be very neutral but are there certain ways certain ways of thinking about how you are preparing this drink that can uh, pair it better with certain foods yeah man um that's that's fantastic you know um nick, you we were all uh, nick and i and, um, and and phil you were we were all hanging out with um with the master distiller of of kyoto gin if uh, anyone listening if you haven't watched the uh, the kyoto gin uh, interview as uh, as as we had we had a few uh, difficulties with with, uh, with the technical side of things, but it's uh, the YouTube version. It's on YouTube. <laughs> if you need to get to the YouTube, the link is in the Facebook uh, page of the of the video. But we asked we asked um, you know we, we asked uh, Alex like like what's the best? How, how do you pair your cocktails with this gin with with food? And he was mentioning a lot of lighter foods so that the drink wouldn't overwhelm. And it might seem obvious, given that highballs today have kind of like we have, we have a little bit to thank the Japanese for, uh, given the aesthetic of the highball. And I think the Japanese have really brought highballs back to the forefront of cocktail culture, um, like worldwide. I love a highball with I like it with sushi. I like it with cold light things. Um, yep. I I love it with I, I so what, today I've been making a corn chowder. Um, I, I had an immersion blender. I, I had a little bit of heavy cream, some bacon, um, some sun chokes, a little bit of uh, salt, pepper, onion, shallot, and let it go. And if I wanted to make a highball to go with the corn chowder, I might not use single malt. Maybe I'll use bourbon instead. And that way the bourbon corn will talk to the corn chowder I'm having there. So besides the actual main ingredient in the highball, if you're talking about like, citrus, if I'm having uh, a highball at the end of the night and I want to have a little bit of like a piece of chocolate or I want to have some, some ice cream, if I'm going, if I'm leaning more confectionery, I might make this same exact drink with an orange peel instead because orange is, orange peel is sweeter than, uh, than like the really bright, vibrant lemon peel. So you can, you can activate different flavors um, in a dish that you're pairing your cocktail with. And uh, remember that a highball is just a super basic template for a cocktail that you can ultimately change however you like. Uh, a drink that, that Nick loves that actually, um, ironically, or coincidentally rather, the uh, master uh, or the, the national brand ambassador of McAllen a few years back ago, his name is Nicholas Villon. He's, uh, he's a Quebecois and uh, his go-to highball, his go-to cocktail in the summer is Highland Park 15-year-old soda water a dash of lemon bitters and a bar spoon, a tiny little teaspoon of St. Germain or an elderflower liqueur. So if you want to affect this drink in a small way, just a little bit, add a teaspoon of your favorite liqueur that you might have at home. This could be an orange liqueur, like a, like a, like a, like a dry curacao. You could use cherry hearing. Uh, you could use creme de cassis. You could use, again, um, you can use you can use green chartreuse if you want to be more vegetal. Uh, the world is your oyster. Look at what you have on your shelf and and think about what flavors you like. I think what would work what works with a lot of whiskeys in a highball is um, apricot, a lot of stone fruit. I think apple brandies and liqueurs work really well. Baron Jaeger is a great apple brandy is a great uh, apple liqueur that I think is delicious and works with a lot of whiskeys. But um, yeah, I, I, I would say two. I, I would say two things. I, I, the first is. Um, you know, one really fun thing is you're getting into cocktails. So if you guys are new to cocktails, I'm like a month ahead of you. I, I, like I really am, am, am a neophyte with cocktails. Uh, and what I did li literally from like May 15 to June 15 was all I made were Manhattans. And I tried it with different, I have access to 500 whiskeys in this, in this house. So, well, not quite, it's like 280 right now. Um, but anyway, I, I, have been basically, um, playing whiskey assassins with all my different whiskeys and, and trying, uh, just all of these different flavors. And the temptation when you're getting into cocktails is like, all right, I made a daiquiri. Now I want to make a Manhattan. Now I want to make this. Now I want to get a cocktail book, right? I have 
I have I have this bar book amongst a hundred other bar books, and it's got seven thousand cocktails in there, right? And the temptation is just let's make everything we can make. <laughs> and what I would recommend is the the thing that cocktails will do is they'll teach you about flavor. Um, people all the time ask me like, when you're taking tasting notes for whiskey, how do you happen upon these crazy tasting notes? And if you sit down with Sammy and Phil and me when we're not on the, the live screen and we're just sitting around and we're drinking, um, you'll hear us throw out the most ridiculous tasting notes. I taste this, this, this. And most people are like, that's absurd. How do you get there? Well, I, you get there because you're paying attention. Lawnmower with uh, hints of guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's messed up, Bill. But yes, you can get that. On <laughs> Not <side>. combined. <laughs> um, but but the idea is like when you're actively thinking about you, you're making your cocktail, or you're actively thinking about what you're smelling and tasting, you'll start to get much more familiar with the flavors and the excitement that I've felt around making Manhattans, just making Manhattans over and over again, is. I started to learn when I want to use which type of uh, vermouth. I've learned when I use this particular whiskey, I need to add just a little bit more of the whiskey. Or if I'm using, the, you, you get the idea. Um, and that's what's really fun is the playing with flavors more so than the, I can make this handbook of 60 different cocktails. That's awesome. That's really fun. But I think the exploration of the flavor palette is what ends up being really, really, really sort of advancing of the experience. Um, we have one last question, yeah. and I'm going to wrap up one, one, one little question for Sammy. Um, well, I, I had one thing to add on that. It's just think of it like the, the, you know, the Kung Fu master does not fear somebody who knows 10,000 different punches. They they fear the one man who who's, who's mastered one punch and punched 10,000 times that same way. That is, <laughs> that, that is frightening. I love you, Phil. Um, so, 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 the last question we have here is uh, Four Roses has a pre-made highball available in Japan. I have had it within the last year, actually. Take it. Uh, and, and it says, uh, is there a reason this drink is so popular in Japan? Um, and, and Sammy actually alluded, it, uh, alluded to it earlier when he was, when he was discussing uh, Kino B and the Kyoto Gin. Um, whiskey has not been uh, – American whiskey has been quite popular, but uh, scotch and Japanese whiskey really did not become popular in uh, Japan until um, the highball became really popular. And the main reason was they can, they can drink – whiskey in highballs and consume food at the same time. Um, if you pour yourself this neat and then you try to pair it with a delicate seafood dinner, um, it just doesn't match well. It's not fresh enough. But when you turn it into a highball, suddenly it's something that you can have with sushi. It's something you can have with tempura. It's something that you can have with a plethora of, of um, drinks. And actually, in Japan, they really like to get down to 14, 10, 9, 8, 7% alcohol by volume with what they're drinking. Um, they're, a, they're the most intense culinary culture food, uh, culinary culture country. Whew, that's some alliteration, um, in, uh, in my opinion, in the world. And as a result, everything they drink has to match the food. Um, Sammy, I, I just uh, b before we wrap up because we've already somehow we managed to go over, which is impressive for us. Um, but uh, before we wrap up, one, give us a little teaser about uh, tomorrow about uh, next week's class, um, and also just just wrap up with what are like the quick lessons, what are the quick things that people need to remember from this class going forward, not just about the highball, but just any rules, any rules that we learned today. Oh, man. Okay. And everybody, don't forget to send us a picture. We want to see a picture. I'll send an email. You can reply to it. Send us a picture of your cocktail. Send me ask mm. us in the questions, whether it's to send it to Instagram, Facebook. Either one is fine. Just make sure you tag us and have fun with it. Uh, but to answer your questions, Nick, um, yeah, the, the, basic, the basic thing to, to, to build upon is w the most important things we're going to learn over the course of these five weeks are, are the techniques uh, the importance of using the right ingredients, but what you should not take away are, is that I have I'm, I'm 
preaching some sort of dogma with respect to uh, ratios. You know, um, if you have a, a sweeter palate than I do, then none of the drinks I make are, are, are going to be favorable to you. And uh, that's normal. You know, we all have different palates. So, so uh, just know that all the cocktails I'm offering are in that, are in that, that middle C, right in, in dead center of the piano. And you can decide to go sharp or flat, play around with it, experiment, but make sure that you are always measuring. If you, if you make a, like a red sauce and you, if, you, if you forgot the bay leaf or it needed to be spicier and you added some more pepper flake, you can't recreate that dish unless you wrote down how you changed it because you're working off of the old recipe that was wrong. So whenever I'm adding something or tweaking something, even if I'm adding a half teaspoon to a drink, I write it down. So I make sure, okay, the next time I make this cocktail, it's not three quarters of an ounce. It's actually, it's a scant full ounce. Or, you know, I might write down something, something different or add a teaspoon three quarters. Have fun with it. Play around with it. Understand that what's more important is, um, is making sure you don't over dilute any ingredients, et cetera. And also make sure that you're sharing with dope ass people. Don't be making it by yourself and not sharing with at least one good ass person because otherwise, uh, what's the point of all this? You know, that, that's share that's, with me. I mean, it's exactly <laughs> you know, Nick, Nick, you have Alex over there. I got Cassie over here. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's important to have something. Um, I got some cats. <laughs> you got some cats. <laughs> <laughs> mm, do you ever? <laughs> I would say, uh, God damn, man. You know, um, the next week we have is the Moto Guzzi. Moto Guzzi is, uh, it's, it's a take on the Manhattan. And for anyone that's based in Boston that's been to drink before, um, there are probably a couple of goofballs uh, in attendance that have. Moto Guzzi oh was my. John Gertson, who was the original um, sort of producer of, of the drink cocktail culture. And it's, it actually kind of continues the... The, the heritage of the Manhattan, which secretly is that the Manhattan launched like 10 incredible riffs on the Manhattan, each of which are better than Manhattan. If you've been in the business long enough and you've had enough cocktails, no one anymore. That's, that's my wife. She's drunk. I don't know what happened. I am not. You totally are. Uh, she, uh, she knows that the, we don't make Manhattans in this house. We make Brooklyn's we make, uh, we, make, we make Saratogas, we make Moto Guzzis. And the second and most important rule of the Moto Guzzi is using a delicious, expensive, rare cask strength bourbon for it. That's a huge lesson to learn is that you need, sometimes you need to make a great cocktail better by using a great whiskey. Yeah, Phil. Phil I right was fully you... expecting to turn this, it, th that was going to turn into a steamed hams joke at some point. <laughs> Hot ham water? <laughs> Steamed hams? Well, I'm from Utica. Oh, I've, I've never Phil, heard of that. Cut the feed. No, uh, <laughs> Phil, 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 before you cut the feed, uh, if, if, you guys haven't, uh, if you guys haven't read uh, Sammy's article on our webpage about uh, using vintage spirits, um, if you just want to get jacked up after you've had a few drinks and you want to get jacked up about drinking nice spirits, take, oh. take, take a peek at it. Um, it's the... Uh, it's at taylorwhiskey.com. It's in the whiskey manifest. Uh, it's a delight. But uh, otherwise, um, he doesn't know how to coming. write. Oh my god! Oh my goodness! Cat oh my god! Here. I don't know who that I is. Cassie, I miss you. Uh, She's, drunk. She's drunk on power. She's drunk on power. Um, guys, ladies, gentlemen, th thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Check out this. Uh, if, if you don't, by the way, if you attend our classes, always have the chat up. Phil and I are usually entering in goofy stuff, and we're also entering links and stuff like that. Um, but if you go into the chat there, you'll see the, the, the Whiskey Manifest, the first article there. Um, and that should get you inspired for next week's class. Um, but thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Sammy, as usual, you were wonderful. Phil, as usual, you were crazy. We love you guys. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much. And Phil. Cut the feed. Do I have <laughs> to? You haven't cut the feed yet? Cut the feed! Hold on. Okay. What ratio? What, what ratio? Uh, I'm, like, I'm cutting the feed. Uh, two to three? Two to four? One, one, one to one. one. Cut I'm the leaving. feed. One to one? Oh, my God. I can't be Oh, God.